Hello and welcome to the TGH College Hardware Podcast. I'm Joe. With me is Greg, as always, here to recap Feast Week and make our picks for the upcoming week of college basketball. First of all, Greg, how are you doing? How was your Thanksgiving? It was great. Uh, did, did a little bit of traveling, both to see family, and uh, I already told Joe that uh, my cousin's a huge Penn State fan, and they were playing at Ford Field in Detroit, so... Uh, we drove up on Friday to a little, did a little road trip, not college basketball, but still college athletics. Um, so went up around and everywhere and had a, a little bit of a, uh, respite day yesterday, thankfully. So, uh, but, uh, did get to watch some basketball as you know, feast week, you know, we celebrate, I guess we celebrate Thanksgiving, but we also celebrate feast week last week, which is much more important, of course. Absolutely. It seemed like a feast week that had a lot of stuff going on. The Maui was very big, and some of the other tournaments had some surprising results, uh, some, of which that, uh, some of which that Greg actually predicted. So let's get into our recap uh, for the week. We're going to start with the non-conference game. There was a lot of tournaments, but we'll start with the one non-conference game that stood alone that we're going to talk about. That is Michigan State and Arizona. This was on Thanksgiving Day. Arizona wins the 74-68. to This continues the theme, I think, for both teams here, Greg, uh, that – we kind of maybe, uh, maybe we as a media people maybe were a little bit low on Arizona. Didn't really know what we're going to get out of Boswell and, and Johnson and everything. Uh, and Michigan State, Tyson Walker is doing his very best uh, to keep this team in it with his scoring punch. But they may not have it in them to be a title contender this year. They actually just dropped out of the AP Top 25. Yeah, I mean, uh, we might be looking at this year's. Not not as as egregious, but we might be looking at this year's North Carolina. Of course, they were uh, number one overall last year and completely dropped out of the poll. Didn't make the tournament. I don't think we're still in that uh, range with Michigan State because we're still talking about yes, some losses, but the only quote unquote bad loss that they've had so far is the James Madison loss, who continues to be a top 25 team uh, at least according to ap voters we're not gonna we're not gonna give them any black marks for losing to arizona and they went out west to play the game on thanksgiving many people probably didn't even catch a lick of this game or know what was happening so it's it's definitely i wouldn't say it's panic time but it's definitely a bit more of a slide especially for a team that I know I I was pretty high on coming into the preseason, uh, and I I believe you were in the same vein, maybe a little bit lower than me, uh, but I I thought this was the Final Four team pretty much, and I mean their losses are James Madison, Duke, and Arizona. None of the one of those uh, that was at home was the James Madison game. There's not there's it's there's not a lot of bad there, but their their wins are. Southern Indiana, Butler, and Alcorn. So they're going to have to to get it going if they want to. I don't know that they're going to get back into that, you know, one two seed conversation. But if they want to, if they want to be, you know, a single digit seed, you know, be in the five to four to three range, they they need to get it going because conference play is right around the corner. Right? They they're only non conference. The big games they got left, they do have. Um, the Bay, it looks like they play Baylor uh, on the on December sixteenth. That's that's one they'd really like to have. Yeah, the way we've seen those teams play, I, I don't think they'll they'll get that game. You got any other thoughts on this? No, just um, they could also do what they always do under Izzo. They can go get a seven seed like, like last year, maybe go on a run. Uh, who knows? They can do that. It's just not fun to have that as your your I guess new plan going forward after losing some of these games, when you have these big games, you want to win, you know, 50% maybe if you're really a title contender. There's going to be games you lose. Uh, I think Kentucky year, Kentucky's championship year in 2012 when they were really dominant, they were like three losses, 38-3 and three overall after the tournament. Like, you're going to lose some games, especially when you're playing good teams like this, but just try to win a couple. So we'll see what they can do against Baylor. Uh, and for Arizona, I do think they're pushing themselves into the title conversation, and that's not somewhere I thought they would be uh, based on where we had in preseason. Greg, I'm going to call it audible real quick. I'm going to go over our notable results before we go to the other tournaments. Hopefully that doesn't throw you off too much, but it's just already on my screen, so we're going to go with that. And we'll start with the one uh, that probably is more surprising. We have Colorado State beating Creighton. Uh, they killed them, 69-48. Creighton scored 19 first-half points. 
there are some issues there. They need to figure things out in terms of their offense. Uh, but Colorado State, Isaiah Stevens is a guy who's going to be a household name possibly down the road. 20 points, 6 rebounds, 7 assists. Big upset for them. We weren't really expecting this in the Hall of Fame Classic. But as we know, in Feast Week, some of these wacky results happen when you have neutral courts and people away from their families on Thanksgiving. It just, it just happens. Well, keep in mind, Joe, Isaiah Stevens is a name, name that we could have known for three, four, five years at this point. So he's not he's not a brand new name, but those of you maybe that don't follow, you know, college ball really closely, he's, he's not a, he's for sure not a freshman, uh, nowhere near that. But this this game, I, I this was one of those eye popping. I look at the score in my phone. What, I can't even remember what day this game was on. I, I know I was either traveling or or something it uh, was wasn't one i was gonna even contemplate sitting down and then you see that that score pop up and you're like oh okay uh of course we knew creighton was gonna have some growing pains losing you know one of their arguably top two players from last year's roster but it wasn't like we were talking about an entire team of of transfers coming in a bunch of young guys this team should have been mostly put together but I think the, we just kind of go with the everybody gets one, you know, mm-hmm. everybody gets one early season stinker. They don't have a lot on the resume of good wins, but for now, just a, hey, everybody gets one move on to the next one. If we start seeing, of course, some kind of pattern, then, then we'll look at that. Colorado state's got a game that we're going to pick uh, coming up this week. Um, but uh, we can get to that a little later. Joe, you want to? You got any other thoughts, or you want to move on to the next one? Let's just move right on to the next one. I think we covered most of that. Let's go to Kentucky and St. Joe's. Kentucky ended up winning this game, but it did go into overtime. Not something you really expected. St. Joe's uh, three and two on the season at this point. They they've lost uh, some good players over the years, but they do have an experienced backcourt right now, and they do throw up a lot of threes. So the thought process is they can beat any team they play, but because they chuck up a lot of threes, they can also lose to a lot of teams if they're having an off night. Uh, they put up a good fight against Kentucky. Kentucky wins it 96-88. to 88. A lot of scoring for Kentucky. The offense is good. But the issues, I think, came from lack of rebounding effort in the start of the game and then defensive breakdowns uh, later in the game that I think they're going to figure out. So I think this might be one of those games where you have a close win. You kind of maybe treat it like a loss because you take more lessons from it and you can get better going forward. They also will start getting some of their centers back, which would help with both the reboundings and the defense defensive issues that they've been having. So got the win. That's the most important thing. Now they can learn from it. Greg, did you see anything different from me? Uh, I, I, this was just a game I turned on like the last when I, when I saw in my app, Hey, this game's going to overtime. I was like, okay, that's an interesting one. One I didn't see coming. Um, they played in overtime. I know Trey Mitchell had that I can recall. He had two uh, open looks from three. That's definitely a dynamic we haven't seen from Kentucky in the past where you've got a big guy that can step out and shoot. Um, we're used to kind of those Oscar Sheepway type bigs and, and well, really not type, just really Oscar Sheepway for the last couple of years. The team that I saw playing overtime – Obviously, they finished with, what was it, an eight-point margin or six-point margin? The team that I saw play in overtime I was like, hey, this is this is that team that I've been looking at, you know, for most of the year. This is the team that we saw take Kansas to the wire. I, I did not have time to go back and watch the entire game, but it, at least we know that if you want to take your grain of salt or, or your silver lining – when they need to turn it on, they can turn it on. Mm-hmm. And they you, when it gets to overtime and everybody starts looking around and saying, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, of course, they did lean on a, a little more of, a, of an older player, you know, instead of one of the freshmen and um, with leaning on Trey Mitchell in that in that sequence. But uh, at least we know that, that that switch is there. If they need to flip it, they can do it. And we'll just take it as, hey, it's a win. It counts as a win on the resume. And, and let's, that's all I got to say about that. So what, you're obviously, again, you're a resident Kentucky fan. You got, I know you kind of gave us a few thoughts. You got anything else on that? Yeah, just uh, I think everyone was so quick to anoint Reed Shepard, the best player on the team. And he played fine, but he was 0 for 1 shooting in this one. Uh, he did have a big steal at the end, and that definitely helped them. So I just you know encourage people not to judge the freshman too soon because this week DJ Wagner had an incredible week. I think he averaged like 25 points and a lot of assists too. 
Kentucky did rebound pretty well uh, in the, their next game of the week, which is against Marshall, and they scored like 118 points. Probably could have put, put up 130 if they would have kept their foot on the gas, but they're they're fine. They just get they need these learn these growing pains, especially without their big guys being there. It does open things up offensively, but defensively there could be some issues. So those were the two surprising results, even though Kentucky did get the win there. Let's go to recap some of the. Events that were going on during Feast Week, we had the Maui Invitational was probably the best Maui Invitational I can remember, at least in my lifetime. Purdue ends up winning it. There was good performances, too, uh, in this tournament. You know, Tennessee, Kansas, UCLA, Marquette, um, just a lot of a lot of good teams that we talked about. But for me, Greg, the big takeaway uh, that I'll start with is Purdue gets the win. They showed they can handle pressure a lot better. They showed they can handle playing uh, elite teams on back-to-back days. They were very, very good and alleviates some of the fears I had last year with some of their freshman guards. Yeah, if you were lucky enough to watch the Purdue-Tennessee game, um, that might have been one of the uglier basketball games I've ever seen. Uh, what was it? It was 40-some fouls, 47 fouls. I, I can't remember what the number was. I don't have the box score in front of me. But that game dragged and was ugly. It was still fun to watch, but it, it, it was just not – pretty swing the ball around freedom of movement type basketball. Um, one point I want to make something I'm, I'm extremely happy about Joe, you know how AP voters can tend to be creatures of habit. Today we see Marquette move up a spot in the AP poll, which they should have because their only loss last week in a stacked Maui field was to Purdue in the title game. Oftentimes we'll see those AP voters, They'll just slot you down a couple of slots when you lose a game. I am so happy that for once we're seeing something that makes sense. Uh, Marquette with wins over UCLA, a team that was ranked until this tournament started, a win over Kansas, and then they play. You know, their only loss there was to Purdue. That's something I liked. There, there was a lot to like from a lot of these teams. I got to see a little bit more of Gonzaga actually play on the court than I have uh, the last couple weeks just since they're out West and sometimes they're on that root sports network or whatever it is. I think that's, I, I think that might be the same one the Mariners play on or something, but um, so I actually got to see them on the court. Uh, it was nice to see them play. Um, nice, nice to see Ryan Nemhard and, and just remind myself how quick he is. Uh, the one, the one note I want to say about Gonzaga is this whole Graham EK jacking up threes he's got me kind of it's got me kind of interested uh he's obviously a dominant big man down low this team does have shooters i i I saw it a lot in the in the in zaga purdue game i don't know if there i i want to say he probably took three or four threes in that game i don't know if part of that was that uh, we've kind of talked about attacking Edie, just draw him away from the basket and maybe he just kind of said if I can't remember who's calling the game, but they kind of said he's, he's been working on that outside shot, but that's something I would want to tone down. I mean, if he gets one or two looks fine, but I, I don't, I don't want him taking five threes a game. There's, there's shooting is, is, is there on this scene. There are other guys that can shoot the ball. Um, Edie, we already talked about, but guy just gets absolutely obliterated in the paint. And still goes in. Joe, I, this is one question I do want to ask you because it does feel like, and maybe this is just because of how he is he is attacked, it it almost feels like when it, he's, I don't know how to exactly to word this, he's like not having a great start to the year because I'm not seeing the ball go in the basket from a field goal standpoint. He's getting a lot of his points at the line. So it, as just strictly observing it's like man it feels like none of his shots are going in but he's also he's also getting the crap beat out of him so i i don't know what you've observed but it just it doesn't have that oh there's definitely a few plays here and there that you know he finishes through contact and whatnot which of course when you're seven four you're gonna have to do that whatnot or finish over people i just i didn't know if you got what what you've seen of his play because i mean we're gonna be talking about this team as, as as far as i know for title contention so but that's just one thing that i just don't i don't see the ball going in the basket as from field goal so what are you thinking i think similarly it's one of these where he's could end up winning national player of the year and he's going to have not as many field goals as almost anyone's had in a long time doing it uh and it's going to be something he i think 
it's a good give and take to have. Like, I'm not overly impressed with his play. He's played well, but not, like you said, the field goals haven't been going in. But also, he's a player that gets hacked probably more than is actually called on the floor, uh, unless they're playing Tennessee and they call everything in that second half. But they, he, I think he's taking advantage of what opportunities are given to him, and he, he's doing well. So, you know, might win back-to-back National Players of the Year. We'll see. I, I don't know. Any other thoughts on, on the Maui before I go into my little spiel? Uh, just Purdue, I think has a little bit more of a deeper roster than, than I realized. Um, Camden Heidi had heard a little bit about last year, but obviously he missed, I don't know if it was an injury or he just straight red shirted. seems like he gives them, uh, some stuff they didn't have last year. Lance Jones. I like as a spark, uh, just that he's, he's quick to the basket. We'll see if the outside shot comes along. There's more to that team than just lawyer braden smith and Edie. there's we haven't even talked about mason gillis caleb first uh there's ethan Moore. there's 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 that team is a complete team it's just will they have the uh the efficiency to to, to get where they can go you know where their potential is you gotta you gotta spiel for us what's your spiel oh i think i texted you about this anyway but uh the point guard this was a this was a tournament of big men it was you know, Hunter Dickinson, we had Zach Eady, uh, we had Igadaro who stepped up for Mar- Marquette. Their, the guard play was not as good as you would expect, and that's something that in March maybe flips on its head and guard play will be more important and just something to watch out for. So we, we talked about Dewan Harris and what he did against Kentucky. He has done almost nothing offensively for himself since. Well, Tyler Kolek had some rough nights uh, in, in this tournament as well with turnovers. And uh, also still hampered by that ankle injury, probably, although I think he's probably feeling okay. Uh, we have just, you know, Braden Smith had a pretty, I think it was the semifinal in this where he had a pretty awful night and had to be taken out. And it was Fletcher Lawyer and Edie who carried him home. Going to need to see a lot better point guard play down the stretch. If we don't get better point guard play, this is a March that will be pretty crazy. Not that March is ever not crazy, but it could be pretty crazy in March if we don't get this because there will be some small school guys who do have good guard play and have developed it or teams that we don't expect, even who are in the big conferences, and they get the job done. But I do think they'll turn it on. Guys like Tower Kolek will turn it on and be fine. Uh, Braden Smith will continue to be better, and uh, they'll, they'll figure it out. It just was very surprising to me that this sport has always been driven by guards. And, yes, for the last couple of years, the National Players of the Year have been big guys, but it just feels like it's a guard sport, and that was not necessarily the case in this tournament. All right, so let's go to the Battle for Atlanta, something Greg called here. I thought he was crazy when he did it, but he ended up getting it right that Villanova won the Battle for Atlanta. This was you know, not as stacked of a field as Maui Invitational, but it, it had some solid teams in there. So, Greg, let's let's take your victory lap right now. Let's see, let's you know, you can go talk about Villanova for a couple of minutes here. Hey, that's that's two that's two for two. Uh, so we're gonna, like you said, we're gonna take that that victory lap. Um, you know. I, I'll be completely honest. I didn't pick this on, on uh, not going on a lot. I think they had just come off of um, destroying Maryland the right before. I think that was the last game they played before they went into this tournament. Just thought maybe they'll get some momentum going. Uh, their, their starters are pretty good. Depth is a question. That's maybe something I, if I have had a second to think about it, say, I don't know about three games in three days of a team with not a lot of depth, how that's going to go. I might've looked at Carolina, but I mean, wins over, uh, it was Texas tech Carolina at overtime. And then they demolished Memphis in the title game. Not your three like biggest wins, but they played three teams that were in front of them in the tournament and they won. So um, I don't, I don't really have a lot to say about them. You know, just, I guess I'll, yeah, and take my victory lap, but uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't pick them based off much. Just kind of th- felt like maybe they'd roll into the tournament, and it, it just felt like they they picked up where they left off. I'm still, even though they won this, like I'm still not ready to say, yeah, it's Villanova top fifteen time. Like mm-hmm. these still weren't the greatest. Win- I mean, we also have Arkansas underperforming in this tournament. We have uh, Michigan underperforming in this tournament. I mean, there's there. There wasn't it, it definitely maybe, maybe it's some of it's the comparison to Maui, but uh, there there wasn't as much to like. But this, I mean, they won the tournament. That's three games, three days. There's you can't really argue with that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm the same way. I'm very impressed with them now. It's not going to be something where I'm going to pick them to win the national championship or even the Big East based off this, but I'm very impressed with what they did given how they've started this season and the Kyle Neptune talk. And, and hopefully, I mean, he did get this back on track for the time being, hopefully for the Villanova fans, he can keep it going. Very impressed with Eric Dixon as well. Knew he was a good player, showed flashes of being a great player in this tournament, 34 and 10 against North Carolina in their overtime win. So I, I don't know exactly what to think of this team. I think they've gone from like thinking, Hey, it could be a lot like last year where they were around 500 for most of the year, or at least bouncing back to 500 at the end of the year, more, more so. So now it's like, hey, they could be a tournament team. They could actually, they can make it. They have the talent to do it. They could, they can get this thing done. So, very impressed with them. It was a decent field. They got some nice wins. I think that'll help them in March at the very least. So that is good to know. The last ter- tournament that we have to talk about is the ESPN Events Invitational. Now Texas A&M was a popular pick by a lot. Uh, ended up being Florida Atlantic who ended up winning it all. Greg, to me, this is important for them too because. We knew that what they had all those guys returning, but they lose to Bryant, and Bryant is not a very good team. And then they come into this thing and beat some good teams and, and not some quality wins. I think that's really important to kind of get things back on track. I think it was maybe just a loss of focus against Bryant, which did them did them in. Yeah, I, I said the back, and this this idea has been repeated. To I'm not the first one to say this, but I think Dusty was when they lost that game to Bryant was jumping for joy because it's like now we can get that underdog card back. Uh, that I don't, I can't remember if that was the last game they played before they went into this tournament, but, uh, wins over Butler, Texas A&M and, and an absolute throttling of, of Virginia tech. Those are three good wins. Um, you know, we don't know what Butler is. We don't know what Virginia tech is, but still that's for them. That's, I feel like that can only help their metrics. Even if those teams are subpar, uh in their conferences with them being in the american this year uh they are now out of cusa for anyone that is not following there they're in the american and the american has lost houston ucf and cincinnati so really their only opponent of note is going to be memphis and maybe you, you might get north texas or uab or something put a little string of games together but i mean those are probably going to be their biggest wins especially since they're neutral um, so of course they're going to be cheering. They're going to be big Butler and Virginia Tech fans. I think that Texas A and M win w- is going to is going to go pretty far for them. We, Joe, you and I both picked them to win, I believe, and we both like Texas A and M. I said in the preseason, I just wasn't sure about it. Got to see them play. Definitely have have raised my my thoughts on them. Um, I know Henry Coleman missed one of these games. I don't know if it was that game or if it was the, uh, or if it was the third place game. I, I, I remember seeing a tweet from someone. Of course, there were so many games every day. I, I know. I just I can't recall which, which game it was that he missed. It's just something. To, it's just something to to note because they ended up squeaking by Iowa State. I think it was the third place game. Um, but Iowa State also, I mean, you know, beat VCU, lost to Virginia Tech, but they they darn near beat um they darn near beat Texas A and M. That's just a team to keep an eye on. I heard I heard and uh, maybe you can remind me of the guy's name. I heard a player's name who had a couple of huge games and I just I can't I know he's a freshman and he's it's a foreign kid. I just can't think of his name right now. It's like Milo's something. I'll I'll look it up. But Joe, you got you got any other thoughts? Yeah, just I I don't I'm not taking anything away from Texas A&M in this one. I'm, you weren't either, but just I think they still played very well. They Wade Taylor had 35 points against Florida Atlantic, obviously a star, all, all American for a lot of people, and they did have those injuries. I think Henry Coleman uh, and Tyrese Radford only played like 14 to 16 minutes against Florida Atlantic, and. Then they had the injuries for the third place game too. I, I still am very high on Texas a and I think if they're fully healthy, maybe things change there. Or if they can be at full strength, or maybe things change. That's going to be something that I think they, they address in the next couple weeks here because I don't know how their depth is. But they did win the third place game too. So I'm, as much as you can be impressed on someone, even though they lose, I think it's very, very good. And Florida Atlantic, I think they are what we thought they were at the start of the season. And we can just kind of focus uh, on on them, you know, going into the AAC and beating Memphis possibly. Iowa State player is Mylon Mumsilovich. 
I'm sure I'm pronouncing that right. There you go. 21 against Virginia Tech, 15 against Texas A&M. A freshman that neither of us had on our radar, I would say, puts up some some pretty good point totals against two some at least Texas A&M quality team. Don't know what Virginia Tech is, but I knew I had seen somebody else. But I was probably Rothstein. I know I saw somebody else. It was buy. It was probably buy stock now or whatever. And then I went and looked at the at the game log, and I was like, okay. All right, that's something to look at because you just never know with these Otzelberger teams since he just – every year it's six transfers. You know, it takes them a couple of weeks to, to get it together. So that's all I got. What, you, anything else or you want to move on to picking games? Let's pick some games. No, I just text saying m impressive, Florida Atlantic impressive, and we'll pick some games now. we got a lot to go over because uh, we have Big Ten Conference play this week. I don't think we're picking any of those games. We have ACC Conference play starting this week. We also have – the ACC, SEC Challenge, the Big 12, Big East Challenge. We got everything going on. So this is a big week, even though there's not a big title like Feast Week. Let's start it off with a game that is going to probably start before this is uploaded, but it is Utah and St. Mary's. This one is at St. Mary's, Greg. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, be our resident St. Mary's uh, rah-rah guy, and you can you can I know you've already talked about Utah a little bit, but I'm gonna pick St. Mary. We'll, we'll kind of go through these quickly. Joe, we're we we're on a little bit of a time constraint, but wanted to get this out today as opposed to tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll pick St. Mary's. Just uh, really just crossing my fingers. Not ready to not ready to say die yet. Not ready to say I was wrong. Uh, Joe, you you talked a little bit about uh, was it Ben Carlson? He's – I'm picking Utah. They have a solid team. they got plenty of, of size. they got shooting. Uh, we saw that this past week. This is a good measuring stick for them, whether they may – hey, if they can make the tournament this year, if they can take that step forward, that's something they can they can kind of use, even if it is a St. Mary's team that is struggling. So I'm, I'm going Utah. I think the shooting is the difference here. Uh, St. Mary's has definitely had issues with some offensive output at times, and I think they can take advantage. Move on to Tuesday this week. We have Miami and Kentucky. This one's at Rupp Arena. This is part of the ACC SEC Challenge. Joe, I'm picking Kentucky, but even as a Kentucky fan, I, I know you've talked a lot about Miami. I would not be surprised if you took Miami in this game. I, I, I really, I actually, given your perspective, Joe, is a lot higher on Miami than I than I have been this year. So I think it'd be more important. Let's get your perspective on this game. I'm taking Kentucky, but let's let's get your thoughts. Kentucky is definitely capable of winning it. It's just going to be playing like they did against Kansas. Obviously, they didn't play that well against St. Joe's. Start off, Aaron Bradshaw is not coming back for this game. He's going to be back in like a week, he said. That was something that was rumored to be happening, and it could have kind of maybe tilted the, the scales a little bit. I'm going Miami because of the guard play. I mean, they've got so many good, good guards. Uh, Omir on, on the inside, Matthew Cleveland transferred in as well. This is a team that is more veteran, that is a very good team. The environment at Rupp Arena isn't the same as it used to be. It's a lot of older folks who do not cheer as loudly as they used to. It's not as intimidating as a place to play. And I think their defensive lapses could really get to them here. I think the rebounding might be a little bit solved by this point, even without the big guys. But the defensive lapses against a team like Miami, who has these good guards, could really put them back. So I'm taking Miami. Could see this going either way. Uh, could be more of a coin flip game, but when you have these coin flip games, I try to go with the experience backcourts, and Miami does have that. All right, let's go to Clemson and Alabama, also part of the ACC SEC Challenge. This one's at Alabama, a battle of football schools. Battle of football schools, and the one of them that's undefeated right now is Clemson. Uh, this is an intriguing game because I feel like we do this with Brad Brownell every year for the past couple of years, and they start off hot. But if you look at their schedule right now, Winthrop, UAB, Davidson, Boise State, Alcorn State, the only one that even sticks out a little bit for me is that Boise State win. It was almost a 20-point win. Uh, I, I like that. Uh, that was in that was in one of the early MTEs, I think. I, think it, I, I don't think it was last week. I think it was one of the – I don't know. It was like the Fort Myers or, or something. But So they won that. They won that, but – this is their first real test. Um, Alabama, as we know, it's, it's a bunch of new guys. There's potential here. I am still picking Alabama. I feel like we do this fraudulent Clemson thing with Brownell every year, and maybe that's anecdotal, but I'm, I'm going to take Alabama in this matchup, and, and maybe we start the uh, 
uh, side eye and Clemson going forward. What are you thinking? Alabama for me too. They have talent on this team and yeah, they haven't necessarily found that out yet, but they've got some new faces. Grant Nelson, I think will be huge for them in this game. Particular in particular, they have it at home. I think that'll matter in this one too. I'm going Alabama. All right. Texas A&M and Virginia also part of the ACC SEC challenge. Uh, Virginia is at home in this one. They are coming off a bad, not a bad loss, but they lost to Wisconsin by a lot of points. Uh, not something you usually see. And Texas A&M, we'll have to see how the injuries go for them. I don't know who's all going to be available, Greg. Um, I'm taking Texas A&M. I obviously, Joe already mentioned their recent result against Wisconsin. That was a game that I believe was on while we were recording last week. Um, I did consider taking Virginia just based on that historic defense, kind of packing it in, preventing Wade Taylor from getting to the basket. I just feel like, I was like, maybe they, you know, if if they're not able to get to the rim as much, maybe they might struggle. Obviously, I I, I believe it was Henry Coleman that missed one of the last games in um, in the ESPN events. Invitate. I toyed with taking Virginia. I'm still ultimately going to. I unfortunately, I think we're ending up agreeing on a lot of these picks this week. But um, I I ultimately am going with Texas A&M. There there were there's definitely pros and cons, and I was kind of weighing it out. But what are you thinking? Texas A&M for me too. Virginia just doesn't have enough firepower, um, and Texas A&M does, assuming they're relatively healthy. If they aren't healthy, they do have a little bit of depth, so that can help out. Um, so I'm going to go with them. If, if it ends up they have some guys injured, maybe Virginia wins, but it's still not a huge, huge thing. I think Texas A&M has already kind of proven themselves as a solid team this year and just kind of have to get things right, get, get, things, get people healthy and get things right. We have a rivalry game, Colorado Colorado at Colorado State. We just talked about Colorado State's uh, big win, and we also have Colorado with a lot of, I guess, big-name players, recruits, everything. I'm going to go with Colorado in this one. Uh, this is definitely an intriguing game with Colorado State fresh off a win over what we would absolutely both say is a better team in Creighton uh, than the one they'll be facing in Colorado. Uh, Colorado had, they were also in an MT last week, overtime loss to Florida state, a little bit interesting. They, they just barely skidded by Richmond. I was high on this team preseason. I feel like I'm leaning on them or on, on kind of that, um, personal bias that I have. And, you know, unfortunately probably going to keep it just like I, am doing with St. Mary's, but there's just the, the names, you know, Eddie Lampkin is like the second dude off their bench. I I just, until yes, I didn't like that Florida state result, but again, everybody gets one. It's a team they took to overtime. So I'm going to go with Colorado in this matchup, but after we just saw Colorado state obliterate Creighton, it definitely wouldn't surprise me. This is, they're not playing a better team. So it wouldn't surprise me to see, um, and the game is at, it is at, um, it's in Fort Collins. So it is at Colorado State. So that's that's another important factor. I, I noticed that I'm picking a lot of away teams this week. So there's definitely potential for me to end up with a bunch wrong. But what are you thinking, Joe? Uh, in interest of time, I'll keep it short. We got a little bit of 10-minute warning here uh, before we have to wrap things up. So Colorado is going to win, in my opinion. They have a lot more talent on the roster, as you mentioned, Greg. And like you said, I believe them in the start of the season. Maybe it's a bad tournament that they had, but I think they can get things back on track. Just trying to stick with the theme of not overreacting to losses like maybe some people did with Florida Atlantic. I don't know. I think most people kept a level head, but I'll stay with Colorado. Have Duke and Arkansas up next. ACC SEC Challenge. Uh, this is on the 29th. This one's at Arkansas. Tremon Mark, I believe, was stretched off in their last game, Arkansas's last game. So, he will not be available. We do know Arkansas has plenty of players available because they have a million transfers. Yeah, I'm going to go with Duke. Uh, Arkansas is just – they're just kind of stumbling, but I think we, we we expected some of that when you're putting a team together, kind of it, a la Iowa State, just a bunch of transfers, a bunch of new guys. We do have some holdovers from last year, but the, the core of the team are transfers, of course – Tremar Mark would make a, a big difference in this game. I'm going to go with Duke, even though we, we've both talked about our kind of our issues with Duke, lack of depth, lack of that kind of third, fourth score. 
But right now, I just uh, Arkansas is not playing in any way at a, at a level that makes me think that they would win this game, despite my my words with Duke. Joe, who you taking? Arkansas for me too. I think the uh, Musselman's very good in March, but I think it's a lot remains to be seen during the regular season. Uh, that's seemingly true this year too. So maybe they get back into the tournament as an eight seed and they go on to runners. I, I don't know, but it doesn't look good so far. They need people to come together, and it's going to be harder with that from Mark available. Houston at Xavier. This one is on Friday. It is the Big East Big 12 Challenge. This one's at Xavier. Uh, yeah, I would love to see Xavier score. What do we think? 45, 50 points against that Houston defense? Uh, it, I would I, – I would if, if we walk out of that game and it's like 75, 55, I might actually be happy. Mm-hmm. I, I legitimately might be happy – I, we talked about Houston from their MTE uh, that they finished up against Dayton last last week. Um, I I don't see any way Xavier I, they don't have the firepower to stick with this team on offense or defense, and that suffocating defense is just. Joe, I was just curious what what uh, tickets were to this game, which just just for giggles. Uh, but my pick is Houston. What, while I look that up, what uh, what are you thinking? Houston, big time. Uh, you're right. Xavier, there's no such thing as moral victories, but I just want to see these young guys get some experience against a tough team and maybe use that later in their careers. Uh, Houston has Jamal Shedd, who I really like, smart point guard. LJ Cryer is a really good shooter. It, they just have too much for Xavier. They'll be able to win on the road pretty easily. Joe, tickets are uh, they're about 40 bucks on Ticketmaster, so maybe he uh, might have to consider the, another podcast road trip. We'll just, we'll just see what it looks like. We'll, we'll keep tabs on it for sure. Next one up in the Big East Big 12 Challenge, we have Kansas and UConn. This one is at Kansas. Both teams have pretty high expectations, especially after UConn's start. Uh, I'm going to go with Kansas. Um, I don't believe Castle's back yet. I I almost feel wrong picking Kansas, but this might be just one of those. Their num- The number next to the name was high at the start of the season, so I'm picking Kansas. UConn's been rolling. It's at Kansas, though, so – it's a. It, it, I don't know what the line is on this game, but it, to me, in my, like in my head, I'm not saying from betting, but like I, this is a pick 'em for me. Like I, I don't necessarily favor one or the other team. What are you thinking? Yeah, I think it's more of a pick 'em too. I'm going UConn in this one though. I think, as mentioned, Kansas has turned into a team that's kind of like Duke, and that they have the one guy in Hunter Dickinson, just like Phil Pawski for Duke, who's going to produce. They need other guys to step up. Uh, they do have Kevin McCuller, which is something more that Duke has, uh, but they have so, like, DeWan Harris has to have more offense. You just can't have a guy on the floor who can't score like that. Otherwise, your team's going to suffer like we saw in the latter years of Kihei Clark at Virginia. Uh, Elmarco Jackson going to be right anything. You know, K.J. Adams going to do anything besides just play close to the basket. Like, that's it's going to cause a lot of issues. Uh, too many paint cloggers. I have UConn was not as high on them starting the season, but what we've seen so far, I will change my opinion and go with them. Marquette and Wisconsin, a little rivalry game here. This one is going to be at Wisconsin. I'll take Marquette. I think Marquette runs Wisconsin out of their comfort zone. Uh, I, You and I were kind of both a little higher on Wisconsin the last couple weeks, and then uh, they had a few interesting results, obviously got it back on track against Virginia. But I just think that as much as Marquette runs, it's just it's going to make Wisconsin uncomfortable. And I think Marquette wins this game. Joe, what are you thinking? Marquette for me too. Wisconsin still not like, you know, I'm not out on them at all, but I do think Marquette has the guard play to get it done. Uh, Cam Jones, I know Tyler Cole gets all, all the press, but I like Cam Jones on that team. I think he's a really good shooter. It can also drive the ball a little bit and puts a little bit of pressure on on those teams. Uh, that, that I think that duo, duo does work very well together. We have Gonzaga, at, at Gonzaga and UNC, and this one is in Las Vegas. I'm picking USC. I, I did like a lot of what I saw from Gonzaga and Maui. I know USC hasn't exactly been strong. Uh, of course, you know, we could find out some injury news later this week that, you know, would make me want to change my mind, but I'm, you know, me, I'm, I, this is my word and I'm sticking to it. So there's not a lot going into this. I just, honestly, I, I see so picking so many road teams and yes, this is a neutral game. It just, it makes me uncomfortable. I, there, I like I'm. It's so, the favorite is not going to win in every one of these games. So 
I gotta pick. I gotta pick something. I don't know. Neutral court game. Number one player in the country. Freshman. Maybe there's. Maybe he just puts on a show. It's Vegas. Anything can happen. You're right. We are seeing more of these uh, true road games for some of these teams for the first time. So it may happen to be uh, more along those lines of thinking. I'm still going, even though it's not a true road game. Going Gonzaga in this one. I've been overly impressed with them too. They're a team that has started off hot, and I just didn't think they had the depth or the maybe the top end talent that they've had in past years. But they're getting the job done. I think they'll be able to beat USC, who has some depth issues and also just some inconsistencies as you would maybe would expect with such a good player being their freshman. Creighton and Nebraska. This one is a little bit interesting. Greg, you had some notes on why this game is interesting that you sent me uh, before the podcast yesterday. Yeah, just Nebraska uh, currently 7-0. and I couldn't tell you off the top of my head when the last time they were 7-0. and This is a very similar resume uh, to who else were we talking about that had a very, they were undefeated. It was a Cle- Clemson. Mm-hmm. It was very light resume. Um, but they do have a win over to Kane who, um, you know, is supposed to be a pretty decent a 10 team 46 in Ken Palm. So they're definitely not a, they're definitely not a juggernaut of a team, but there's some names that the, the bigger thing is, I think there's some names on this team that, we know, um, and we've gotten to know, and then they they brought in. So there's Casey Tominaga is the one that I think we've known for a little while now is is a pretty good player. Juwan Gary transferred in, and he had one of the games that it might have been the Duquesne game. He had a ridiculous game. It was it was he put he dropped twenty five or something. There's uh, there's just there's a, there's a little bit to this team that makes this game interesting. Of course, it is in-state rivalry as we saw with college football this weekend anything can happen i'm still picking creighton but i think this might be worth your time to watch this was one of the only sunday games i think that of that was of any interest obviously creighton's just coming off getting destroyed but it's at pinnacle bank so joe what are you thinking i'm going creighton i think it's more just uh they have more talent i i would think in the Nebraska light resume, in my opinion, I think they're maybe propped up by some easy wins. And Creighton, while they did lose to Colorado State, I think Colorado State's a solid team, and they'll get things back on track. One of those early season losses that you have mentioned that you just kind of move past. It's not even that bad of a loss, honestly, with Colorado State, but you just move past and, and kind of learn and figure out how you're going to approach the next game. So I have Creighton in that one. Those That's the last of the picks. Greg, any final thoughts for the week? Yeah, I just can't wait for everything to go exactly as planned. All of the favorites to win, no upsets whatsoever, and for just everything to go as we predicted. Absolutely. My turn to remind everyone to like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, wherever you get your podcast, give us five stars. Give us one star. Tell us what you like and don't like about the podcast. We'll definitely use that feedback. For now, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.